Hey, what's up? So you're about to watch a interview with Petros Manos who invested $220,000 into TradingView and we walk through his portfolio to talk about macroeconomic conditions and a bunch of other stuff's happening. Unfortunately, I screwed up and my audio levels were messed up on his end. So I had to go back through the edit and basically boost his levels. So there's going to be a lot of inconsistency audio wise. You're going to hear a lot of static and noise. I apologize for that. I can't do much more about it. That's not going to happen again. I just want you to be aware of that so there might be some peaks and valleys if you're listening to this on headset you might want to tone it down just a few notches just in case you hit like a high spot or something all right welcome to an interview with petros manios one of the original ogs of creating youtube videos for composer if you haven't seen his youtube channel yet it's petros manios finance um, he's got a lot of great videos and is the original youtuber of uh, composer and shameless plug real quick if you have not seen or are not in the discord yet and you're watching this on youtube channel there'll be a link below where you can join into the this educational discord channel which we are building around composer there's tons of content in here tons of uh, information and stuff you can learn we have symphony shares we've got some machines in here that create some pretty insane APYs. They probably won't last forever as we've been discussing stuff, uh, but some of them get up to the thousands of uh, returns over a six month or one year period. And there's also a lot of educational content in here. And all of these things are 100% free as of now that might change in the future. But right now, if you're looking to learn more about Composer, go ahead and jump into the Discord server. Uh, all right, let's go ahead and jump into it. So you, uh, Originally started making YouTube videos about how long ago with Composer? Um, it was right when they first started, so it was over a year ago. Uh, I was the first one to start making videos uh, using Composer. I was actually one of their first users, I believe, as well. So I was right in the beginning um, with Ben, Ananda, Ronnie, uh, Anya, so on and so forth. And um, yeah, and I started on Pietro's Manios Finance, but all my content now is on Manios Compounding Machine. Um, so I started there and I shifted all my content over here. But um, yeah, it was actually, I was introduced to it. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, Logan Kane, writes for the investment uh, website Seeking Alpha. Oh, really? I think they had, yeah, and I, I actually wrote for Seeking Alpha as well. Um, for a time, I would do um, blog posts where I would update my portfolio value. So if you if you Google Pietro's Manio Seeking Alpha, you can look back. I think they're still there uh, at the blog post. And so I think Composer reached out to Logan, and he really wasn't interested as much in algorithmic trading, but he's like, my close friend Pietro's Manios would love this. So um, Logan gave me their contact. I, I reached out to them. I was a, a beta user. And uh, yeah, I was just enthralled with it from the very beginning. Okay, what's uh, what's your background in finance? Was it just originally writing with Seeking Alpha? I'm assuming because you have real estate, you've been doing money in finance for a while. Yeah, I mean, really, I would say I'm, I'm 42 right now, Garen. I've been really seriously investing since I was 35, 36. Before that, um, you, you know, I was actually, I, I went to, to the University of Miami, I majored in English literature and classical antiquity and art history. So I was very much interested in the humanities and books and reading. And I've kind of transitioned and taken my love of reading and learning and just kind of transitioned it from the humanities uh, into to finance uh, and real estate and, and so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, I just kind of self-taught really. Um, just read every book I could get my hands on and, uh, and just have done well in both real estate and the stock market yeah that's basically the exactly how i started too yeah i couldn't tell that you're you're a, an avid reader with the background <laughs> have you I, I you <laughs> have you read have you read them all or some of them they're just to impress girls when they come over <laughs> you know i i pretty much read i'm a reader man i try and uh, you know to read and uh impressing girls is in my past <laughs> yeah uh, but yeah yeah so um, no, I'm, I'm a big reader, and actually, you know, I also got that a little bit from Warren Buffett. Um, you know, when you when you do a deep dive into Warren, um, seventy percent of his day, eighty percent of his day is reading. Um, you know, Bill Gates. You know, oftentimes very successful people are are big readers and learners. Um, so I, I try to emulate that as well. Yeah, I I, uh, 
I don't know what your background was in school and college. Well, I guess you went to college and graduated. I was not academically inclined. I almost failed high school by one credit and didn't go to college. And I always educated myself on YouTube videos and reading stuff online, but I never picked up a book until 2017 when I quit my career for YouTube or I quit my 12 year manufacturing career to start my YouTube channel. Originally it was going to be DIY stuff in my garage for my professional experience, but I quickly learned that I, when I hated doing it in my professional life, I also hated doing it in my garage. So that didn't work well. And then I blew up about $13,000 in the bank account and racked up $10,000 in credit card debt. And that's when I decided I need to learn money and finance and business and entrepreneurship. And if I'm going to do this, I need to take it serious. And then I consumed as many books as I possibly could in like a five to six month period. And now I, I don't even know where I'm at, but I would say books have been life changing for me. Uh, it's something that a lot of people don't really value enough. I don't think. Totally. And you, you actually did a video about that. I think uh, on your YouTube channel, which I enjoyed where you, you talked about reading as many books on personal finance as you could. Yep. Fit. Probably link that in, in this description. I think it's like I read every book on money that that you can think of. <coughs> the exact type. But. Yep. Uh, Fifty books on money. Um, there you go. Did pretty decent, and yeah, I'll link it in here for chat any, for anybody that wants to watch it. I'm I'm assuming a lot of people that are into the Discord don't even know that I make YouTube videos other than the Algo channel. Um, I don't usually promote this one too much. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Um, so what? What uh, what got you into algorithmic trading and specifically Composer? Why'd your friend refer, uh, what's his name, to you on this? Yeah, yeah. So initially, and, and I would still say to a certain extent, I gravitate more to fundamental Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, uh, Monish Pabri, value-oriented investing. And, um, and, and just like, I, I constantly reading about markets and learning, you come across other philosophies and theories. And you know, coming across uh, Jim Simmons at, at Renaissance Tech and uh, Derek Nielsen mentioned the Medallion Fund, yep, uh, which is actually alluded to kind of in the show Billions. But it's you know that that basically using mathematics, um, looking uh, for patterns for uh, repetitive uh, patterns in in markets, uh, exploiting that using algorithms to do so. Um, so yeah, just kind of coming across Rentec and, and, and D.E. Shaw and other sort of quant shops and just doing doing research on it. So I would talk to Logan about, oh, I'm reading this book on Jim Simmons. And um, also at the time there was a there was an investment, there was a brokerage named Motif where it's, it subsequently went out of business, but Motif allows you to build what they would call Motifs. And you can build these very simple strategies, not on base, not like Composer, like, 200 day moving averages or anything like that. But you could just put like basically a couple stocks or ETFs in a basket and rebalance it X amount of times quarterly. And so I was running some, some strategies in Motif and uh, Logan knew about that. And uh, and then when Composer reached out to him, he's like, this is even better than Motif. Um, yeah. So that's how it kind of all came. Sounds like uh, M1 Finance. My my start, yeah, my my start in uh, was day trading and penny stocks actually in technical analysis in 2017. Mm -hmm. The video how I learned to day trade in a week, and then eventually learned that that it's not exactly a scam if you if you really know what you're doing and you take it seriously. But I quick quickly learned that I'm too extroverted and too impulsive, and I can be good for a while trading, and then eventually my emotions screw me over. I get too overzealous, and then I uh, end up losing money. So that's why I transitioned into algorithmic and uh, just design strategies because I over the past five years I've studied finance and technical analysis pretty extensively, and I found Composer, and I was like, oh shit, I can deploy my knowledge on this stuff and completely remove my emotions from it. And yeah, one thing led to another. Um, I would love to get your recommendations too on any books for algorithmic, algorithmic trading. Um, the only ones that I've really read so far are uh, un, uh, Unknown Market Wizards, uh, Chapter 8 from, uh, what's his name? Um, he's a really good writer. Uh, he's got a lot of good books on uh, finance. But yeah, if you have any, I'd love the recommendations. I think your your volume just went out. Are you still there? Yep. Can you? Oh, what happened? Hello. I think you just muted out a little. Yeah, I think I'm having 
I think I'm having uh, internet issues, but what did I cut off at? Yeah, just, uh, I guess it's the, the book, The Unknown Market Wizards um, that you were referencing. Yeah, that's the pretty much, well, that, and I've been reading um, Market Sense and Nonsense, which you can only get on Kindle, and that's been a really great book for um, long term. The, the first chapter or couple chapters is on um, the, they do back test to like the 1970s, uh, figuring out if you should buy the highest returning stocks or the lowest returning stocks in a one year, three year and a five year period. And it was found that dip buying or like buying the lowest RSI technically, but cumulative returns works better over a longer time frame. But if you have any book recommendations on uh, algorithmic trading or quant trading, I'd love to hear it. Yeah, um, there's a book, More Money Than God, I believe is the title. And that isn't necessarily specific to algorithmic training, but it's specific to hedge funds. And um, at references Jim Simmons because it references hedge funds. And so then you get into the algorithmic. And then, like I said, there's Jim Simmons and Renaissance Tech really kind of are, are, are the sort of the Mount Olympus of, of it, if you will. And um, there's, a, there's a biography, um, I don't know off the top of my head, I believe it's called The Man Who Solved the Market or The Man Who Solved All Markets. Um, we'll have to, I'll have to find it after the chat and send it to you. Um, it was a like wall street journal, uh, book. And it's just basically a study on the history of Renaissance tech at Jim Simmons. Okay. Yeah. We'll probably end up making a channel on just on books or something. Um, cause it's, it's yeah. definitely worth, worth the stuff. Um, what'd you say the two names were the two guys that you said the writers? Uh, I, I don't know that the author is at the top of my head. I know the first one is, I believe, titled "More Money Than God." If we if we go on our phone here, we can probably pull it up and then. I'll I'll let the chat I'll let the chat figure that out. If somebody wants to try to find those books yeah, and, and link them link them in the chat, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah. Um, so so how how's uh, your composer portfolio going? Um, how, and how's it? been going since the discord and these new machines being put out, uh, especially like Derek's uh, TTTQ and uh, if you're in the beta ballers yet. Yeah, so just one quick thing, looks like Stone just did share it, The Man Who Solved the Market, How Jim Simmons Launched the Quant Revolution. That is the book I was referencing. And then someone shared the other one, More Money Than God. Um, so those two books are linked here in the chat now. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. Yeah, my, my composer, um, I have actually two accounts that I, I kind of run or manage. I have my individual account, um, and then um, I created an account for my mom. And what's fascinating is my individual account for myself, um, I have a lot of strategy that I created and um, from Motif. I have one that's sort of uh, basically Ray Dalio's Leveraged All Weather. Um, I have another one, Balanced Out for Three Times Leverage. Uh, that's similar to the hedge fundy um and so that that's down right now um to a certain extent my mom's account which i actually started running a lot of i use your name i it's what i, what I would call the garen phillips uh manifestation and composer which was when you derek nielsen cody haas eric snellman started designing taking composer from really kind of like hedge fundy motif sort of simple strategies into strategies within strategies and um, nesting strategies within another and, and so I have heard a lot of that and that one's done um, very very well even with the market crashing which uh, which is indicative that I feel that you know what you guys have done here in the discord um, you know like I mentioned Derek and a couple others is really the future of composer I mean I have to even think that Ben and Ananda are just blown away to create a composer at the sophistication and the high IQ uh, symphonies that are being created now. It's mind blowing. I was the first, the first one, like on YouTube, kind of showing these, like you know, pretty sim simplistic strategies, and um, just seeing them now, it just, honestly, it just blows my mind. Yeah, I, I had a that pretty big write up in the Slack channel originally, uh, where I was like. Composer's not just a software. It's 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 gonna be like a decentralized community. And then I was like, screw it. I'm just gonna start the Discord and do it. <laughs> and now we're here. Only we're only four weeks deep, and I'm amazed at what people are creating. Um, and I'm excited to see the new people coming in and what new minds are gonna turn out in the next six months to a year. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I just, I, I log on and I, and I pull up these strategies and I follow them. And sometimes I, I throw, and this is, again, from Warren Buffett. Sometimes Warren Buffett says, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll buy a stock, a small amount, just to follow it. And so sometimes I'll throw like $100, $200, a couple hundred dollars, some of these strategies. Not necessarily because I believe that they're going to detain Alpha, and they very well may, but it's just because they fascinate me. And I'm just so curious uh, over the next five years, ten years, how they do. And, you know, the, the returns are astronomical, some of them. But just kind of <laughs> not only following them, but just adding a little live capital to some of them. Yeah, yeah, that's how I started originally. And I guess that we'll kind of segue into, like, t coaching some of the newer guys coming in. Uh, it's very it's very enticing to throw you know all of your portfolio into beta ballers or tttq for the long term but um you do have to manage proper in my opinion it depends on your philosophy but proper portfolio uh allocation and not going too heavy into one machine um and eventually we'll get to the point where we have so many great machines that you can just load them all and end up having a pretty diversified portfolio. I don't know if you saw the zero beta, the thousand dollar challenge that we're running uh, this month, but uh, yeah, a lot of people have been uh, building essentially zero beta strategies that uh, are disconnected from the SPY. So a lot of like uh, precious metals and energy and oil, uh, emerging markets, any, any kind of strategy that's kind of uh, segued away from SPY, but also has a zero beta. So it's completely like disconnected, but it has a, a really good drawdown and a really good a a APY overall. And then the idea is we're going to take those, nest them into the three-way volatility switch. Uh, have you seen the volatility switch? Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to nest it into that uh, for when the markets go crazy and, you know, markets are crashing or like COVID or whatever. Um, you switch to those z uh, zero beta strategies or uh, Derek actually just released a new framework on macroeconomics. Uh, have you seen that one? It, uh, it switches between high inflation, low inflation, bull markets and bear markets. Uh, what's the title of the symphony? Let me, let me share my screen. And then after that, I'd like to, uh, if you would, are you cool with sharing your screen and portfolio as well? So people can see like what you've been doing. Um, yeah, yeah, that should be fun. We can, we can do it after this one, but, um, the new framework is normal or high inflation framework, uh, by Derek and okay. He did tag it. So this is the strategy. Actually, let's jump to the. The thread um, and <laughs> essentially <clears throat> I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the three-way volatility switch or maybe a two-way volatility switch to keep it simplified um, and then we'll nest our strategies into this framework we're, we're doing a lot of back testing right now to figure out what strategies work the best in what scenarios in the market but it's our attempt to kind of refine and reframe um, try to figure out the, what signals and what strategies work best in uh, rising markets and bear markets. And then also we're trying to create a, a strategy or a way to turn off and on based on inflation um, when bonds are going up. So the strategy is pretty straightforward. It looks first at the S&P 500. Um, and if the S&P 500 is above its 200 day, then we're in a bull market. And then it goes into TLT and it looks at the 400 day a uh, move average of TLT. And it's essentially looking at rising rates, falling rates of TLT. And that's where we figure out if um, the market is in contraction of bonds or is uh, expanding on bonds. And then I can, I can show the EMA real quick. Did you have a big background in technical analysis before? No, it's, it, it's actually interesting. See, you're coming to composer from kind of the technical background and I'm coming more from the historical fundamental. And so all of this is, is very uh, new to me, the RSIs, the MACDs. And so, you know, I've just been kind of following along and studying it and learning. Um, but, uh, but like I said, I was reading a lot in financial education, a lot in fundamental, um, like let's say jo Joel Greenblatt's magic formula, uh, Benjamin Graham, David Dodd, value investing, which led into Warren and Charlie which led it to Monish Pabri and Guy Spierre, kind of that value oriented. Um, and, you know, to a point that you, you brought up earlier, I think it's a, it's a great point to make. Um, you know, for me, uh, I have a lot of capital um, 
in just vanilla index funds. I know it's not sexy. And I have another account with TD Ameritrade. And so a lot of these strategies are um, things that if they went to zero, I would feel depressed, a little sad. That wouldn't blow me up. So I think that your point also of is kind of having like another nest egg, if you will, or, you know, like, like for example, Composer released Opus 12, you know, or there's, I actually have a lot of capital in a 70, 10, 10, 10, um, which Kyle Birmingham profiled me on, on Composer Power User, um, which I call a permanent portfolio. So for example, let's say, let's say uh, someone in this chat won the lottery tomorrow for 15 million. For me, personally, my advice would be not to put 15 million in a lot of these exotic strategies, but maybe 12 million in vanilla index funds and maybe 3 million in some of these, these particular hyper-sophisticated strategies. Yeah. Having that lion's share in a more traditional conservative approach. Yeah. And that's very Jack Ogle, but that's just my own personal yeah. kind of take on things and how I've done well. Like you'll see when we do the screen share, like a lot of my composer stuff is down my account, my mom's account is actually up. That TD Ameritrade, you know, with a lot of money that is just vanilla, what I call vanilla index funds, value stocks. So just having a lot of that, and then real estate holdings, I think that having a lot of that diversity, not only in the stock market, but outside of the stock market, as far as various cash flows, it actually helps you endure more volatility within the stock market. Yes, because yeah. If you have rents coming in from real estate, if you have, let's say, a, a six-figure job or what have you, all of that just enables you to endure volatility a lot better. In, in yeah, that's what I learned when I st started getting into day trading and stuff. Because I, it, when you first start in investing, you're usually only studying one thing, and you become hyper focused and specialized in those investments. And then it becomes very stressful when those investments aren't going right. So I, I started to do the same thing where I branched into real estate. I'm getting into private equity now, as well as um, the regular algo and then just dollar cost averaging it. If I was to win 15 million today, I would immediately go drop 2 million on land. Uh, just flat default land, like somewhere where re re really low, um, hopefully low um, property taxes. And then I would then buy another million or two in cash flowing real estate to cover those, that interest and those charges. And then you can actually use the land. Uh, you can take out a loan on uh, the land when you see opportunities in another market, like when the market stock market's crashing, you can leverage out of that into another asset class that is underpriced and then profit on that. So my, I, I think our strategies are probably very similar where I look at all different investment classes and then I basically see like a lever zero to 100, like this is super expensive right now. I'm not going to touch it. Okay. It's super cheap. Now I'm, I'm going to roll money and equity into that. And then you just, it, it turns into a thing where you're just rotating money around your assets, depending on what the markets are doing. And it's a lot less stressful. You describe, yeah. And you described exactly my life in that. You mentioned land, you know, the property, the short term rental in North Carolina is 40 acres. You mentioned, you know, cash flow in real estate. I have 24 units of real estate and 25 now, in, including the Airbnb, um, you know, throwing off cash. Uh, then the TD Ameritrade account, which is more Jack Bogley, Warren Buffetty, more conservative, um, low P stocks, index funds. And then there's Composer, which, um, I don't want to use the word play money to act like 200,000 plus is play money. But you know, if, if that 200,000 went to zero, it wouldn't wipe me out. Yeah. So you said you started, you didn't start investing uh, until uh, 2000 or till you were 35 and you're 42 now. So seven years, what do you feel like is the best thing you did? What, what, what really amplified or scaled your, your net worth and your investments? Was it get, getting a high cash flowing job or was it, it, uh, it was really real estate. I, I made a lot of, I, I studied, you mentioned YouTube. I mean, I studied guys, Grant Cardone. Um, you know, I saw you follow a guy, Alex Hermosi. Yep. Hermosi studied Grant Cardone has done videos with Grant, but you know, um, I studied for like a year or two. I watched every Monday Grant at a real estate show. Mm -hmm. He analyzed deals. He talked about underwriting, he talked about, 
you know, it's the opposite of Dave Ramsey, which is Dave Ramsey is against debt. Robert <laughs> Kiyosaki, Grant Cardone are very much like the power of debt. Yep. And, you know, so, uh, to, long story short, the property in North Carolina actually um, owned previously, and I sold it, and then I took that money and I bought uh, 52 units of cash flow in real estate, and then I sold it, actually two trailer parks, it was a 28 and a 24. I sold the one for profit, um, and then I refinanced, and I got this from Cardone and Kiyosaki, I refinanced the other one twice, not once, but twice, and I got it from Cardone, he would be like, you know, I own this property for 11 years, I refinanced it four times, pulled out a couple million dollars, so really, um, you know, coming from the real estate side, and then and then marrying that a little bit with like the motif, the M1, and now Composer. Um, yep. But, but coming from that real estate angle. Yeah, one of the interesting things I learned about uh, real estate and when it comes to debt is uh, it's actually dangerous to have too much equity in your house. A lot of people think that, you know, you, oh, you should pay off your house all the way and then uh, you just have the taxes and all that. But the reality is you have asset, you have, you have, you have money that could be liquid, that could be uh, increasing its velocity. Uh, for those that don't know what velocity of money is, it's essentially the speed at which your money doubles or the speed at which you can deploy your, your uh, how, how efficient is $1 uh, that you have? Most people, their velocity is under one and they're losing money uh, through their life. But when you can amplify that above one, then you start compounding your money. Um, but I learned that you, depending on what the economic condition is, um, after like a after a crash after an economic recession um you could probably leverage down on your mortgages to maybe 30 percent or so if you're risk adverse and then as you as the markets climb and we get closer to a recession or a collapse you want to scale to about 50 to 70 percent equity and then uh when the markets crash that's when you take out the you you leverage your asset to take out a loan to purchase whatever asset classes you see are most valuable Kind of buy, borrow, die is, is an expression that a lot of people use. You know, like you said, you're leveraging assets. Um, and I think one of the secrets to getting rich uh, is not only doing that, but it's okay. When you do the refinance, like when, you, when you get 200000 from the bank or 400000 or 800000 what is it that you do with that? Because if you're taking that and you're buying liabilities or flashing things, that's oftentimes people who don't compound. This is another thing I learned from Warren Buffett. You know, is I, I live in Boca Raton, Florida, which is oftentimes called the Beverly Hills of Florida. It's a very flashy, very wealthy area. And so I go to the gym, Karen in the gym, um, I see Lamborghinis, Maseratis, McLaurins, you know, all these these fancy cars. I drive a Ford Echo Sport. I'm worth, I don't know, maybe $4 million, $5 million. And I say that just because, again, I, that's the one thing I kind of have learned from a Dave Ramsey a little bit um, or, or Warren Buffett is that absence of flash. And when you're getting this money, Garen, is continuing to compound. Now, always be compounding, right? Like taking that refinance money and buying another asset. And then that one appreciates and it's either sold or refinanced and it's buying another asset. You know, and, and there's a biography and someone can put, link this book on Warren Buffett called Snowball, I believe, is the title of the biography. And the reason it's called Snowball is it's a reference really to compounding and compound interest is you're taking that ball of snow and you're slow, slowly pushing it down the hill and accumulating more and more snow. And so the, the idea of the snowball has it, been really helpful uh, to me. And it's something that I, I continually you know, preach and, and believe in. Um, so, yeah, I, I agree. I, uh, people watching. um, Derek, could you, uh, Derek, could you link, uh, Rich Dad Poor Dad and Rich Dad Poor Dad Cashflow Quadrant? Those are my two most recommended books that anybody should read. Anybody that's in this Discord right now or watching this video, if you have not read the first two Rich Dad Poor Dad books, it's you're doing a disservice to your wallet. Um, the, uh, back to what you were saying, um, well, uh, I lost my train of thought. You were talking about flashy compounding. It's a flash and um, the, the oh yeah yeah. You know Warren Buffett. Yeah. You know, it, it can go a little over the top. I mean, as a you know, it's worth billions of dollars in two dollar breakfast. It can be a little again crazy. But my, my point is, again, I live in Boca Raton, which is a very 
it's like maybe like a Los Angeles or New York. It's very flashy and kind of in your face, nouveau riche uh, wealth. And I always try to what I call keep the spirit of Omaha, even if I'm in a Los Angeles or New York or Boca, you know, or Scottsdale or a place like that, the spirit of Omaha, which is, you know, that frugality and that constant focus on investing, uh, whether it's real estate, stocks, businesses, I'm um, just focus on that frugality and investing. Yeah, that's what I was taught to from my family. My, my grandfather started a business in 47, which is now a uh, multi-million dollar manufacturing facility that I was supposed to inherit and take over. And I quit and turned, started a YouTube channel. Um, but I was always taught my, my grandfather wasn't a flashy guy. He, uh, he had a lot of money, but he, he wasn't driving Lamborghinis. We had a lot of classic muscle cars, but that was more of a cultural thing in Indiana. Uh, we, we a lot, mo big motorheads in the area that we live in. Um, it wasn't for flash. It was just cause we enjoyed it. Um, but yeah, the one thing that people don't really know or think about uh, about Warren Buffett and the reason that he is, was one of the richest men in the world is he, he started investing when he was eight. And yeah. if you do the math on compounding interest, um, pretty much anybody, if you, the best thing you could ever do for if you have children is take like $5,000 and throw it into an investment account and just let it sit. Because by the time they're 30, they're basically set for life. Um, yeah, th the difference. The, the difference between, uh, and especially if you do in, do it in a family trust or a tax deferred account or some some way to, if you have a tax strategy, just handle this stuff. But uh, the big the difference between a thirty year compound and a a uh, forty year compound, like like if you start investing in when you're twenty, and you don't demolish your net worth doing stupid stuff with your money, which a lot of people do. Um, the difference between starting when you're 20 or starting when you're 30 is about a 40% loss in value. So if you do the math and you come out with um, two, like a million dollars at the end of the 40 years, if you cut 10 years off of that time, um, you only come out with like $600,000. It's, it's almost half. Yeah, you can, yeah, you can totally, and I, and I do it a lot, you can totally geek out on a compound interest calculator on money chimp. And, and to that point about Warren, you know, if you look at like the history of his net worth, so much of it was after he was 50, 55, you know, because that's when compounding to the point there gets really exciting. And so that's why to be composer is exciting because when you understand compound interest, you understand the difference between a 16% return, yeah, 15% return over 20 or 30 years. And then you start getting these Garen Phillips, Derek Nielsen, J. Wong Ju, Cody Haas strategies. Or Snellman, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, Raycon is another guy in there, you know, and you start seeing instead of 15 or 16 percent, you know, you're at like uh, like 102 percent. I mean, you, you, you know, I mean, and, and will these perform like that in the future? Who knows? But you actually said it to Derek. You said, okay, even if it doesn't do 102 percent, it's likely that it does greater than 11 percent, 19 percent return or a 20 percent return. You know, here's one other thing I'll say that is an investing truism that I've learned from reading as many books as I can on, on stock market investing. Truism to me is if you compound over an investing lifetime in that 20 to 30% range, which I noticed some composure users now seeing these returns, they'll thumb their nose at because of how astronomical some of these strategies are. But if you, know, you, look, at, you look at Carl Icahn, 29%. Uh, uh, David Tepper owns the Panthers, 29%. And you know, Warren Buffett, 22 um, you know, when you're, because you start playing with the compound interest calculator, you start with $20,000 or $50,000 and you compound that at 23%. You know, Monish Poverty, a great book, so much in Lincoln called The Dondo Investor. He's probably the disciple of Warren Buffett. His license, California license plate, is Mr. 26%, which means his goal is that 26%. Um, that's where, you know, you, you, you really can accumulate major wealth. Yeah, I agree. Um, the, let me show, let me show people that don't understand, like there's a, even 5% difference in, in APY over a period is an insane. Yeah. Yeah. It's an insane amount of money. 40 years, Gary, you like, like a hundred, say someone had an IRA with a hundred thousand dollars and it's over 40 years. It's the difference between 15 or 16, so only 1%. So a lot of times people have money that's managed with an investment advisor and they charge 1%.
Um, and then you're actually going to lose a lot more than 1%. But even like 15 to 16% over 40 years is astronomical. Yeah, the um, sorry, I'm trying to set up, uh, I'm trying to live stream through TikTok right now, but it's, I, I never live stream through TikTok. Um, so here's how I like to explain it to people because it makes it simpler if you do like an 8% return over, I like to put it in terms of how many years till your money doubles because that's, that's a simple way for people to understand like time-wise. Um, so 8%, one year to, oh, wait, wait a second. Um, one times 8%, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, roughly nine years to double your money at an 8% return, which is the stock market. But if you take that to a 20% return, one, two, three, four, you've just cut your doubling in half. So you, now it takes you half as long by once you get up to a 40% APY, you're basically a millionaire within 10 years. You like, you'll have mul yeah. millions or multiple million. And that's with a single investment too. That's like a one time drop of money. Um, one times 0.4 is one, two, two, two years. So every two years, your money's doubling. So if you can manage a 40% APY, which I know sounds insane to a lot of people, but you can't actually do that in private equity and certain investment styles that a lot of people are not familiar with, or they're not educated on. I, I know, well, I can't, I can't tell you APYs because of legal stuff, but I've seen APYs in private equity that are much higher than 40%. Um, and then we have these machines that are doing the same thing. Um, well, they back test to that, that amount. So two, let's say you had $10,000 and you could maintain a 40% APY uh, for the rest of your life, which is rough, but let's, let's pretend. So times, um, 1.4 first year, second year, you've doubled third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, 10th. So by 10, a, a single investment of $10,000, you've got a quarter million dollars. And that's not calculating uh contributions if you, i'm a i'm assuming most people are going to continue to make more money as they get older so you're dumping more money into this so technically it'd probably be more like 300 to half a mil um so that's 10 years 11 12 13 14 15 16 17 18 19 20. so basically you've retired <laughs> you're done and that's with a single contribution well, that's, I mean, you kind of described the life of a, a couple of people I mentioned, Carl Icahn, David Tepper, Warren Buffett. They're not at 40, but I believe Icahn and Tepper are 29 and Buffett and Berkshire's are 22. So you can see when, again, you're above that 20%, what that turns into over an investing lifetime. And then, you know, the longer that you're into it, you know, so I'm 42. If I, if I'm 70 or 75 still doing this and still investing, um, or sometimes people maybe retire and just play golf and, you know, and then they're not actively uh, investing any longer. Maybe it's just, you know, just vanilla index funds. So not really attaining any alpha. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's just fascinating when you, when you start playing with the math, playing with the compounding calculator uh, and seeing what, what really can be done. Yeah. It's uh 40% is, is un pretty unrealistic, but I'd like to say, never say never. Um, yeah, so. <laughs> I mean, you know, you mentioned 40 and, and Derek mentioned this. You know, and that's why um, like the book that I mentioned, the man who saw uh, the man for all markets, or the man who saw the market. The I mean, Rentec and the Medallion Fund. I believe they're in the yeah above forty. Yeah, I think they're sixty. You know, I've heard. Fund. Someone, someone could Google that. You know, returns the Medallion Fund. They could get it, but that's a fund. Uh, you know, and that's why they're all multi-billionaires. The uh, the uh, founders of, of of that and people that are in that, because like you mentioned, you're doubling money so often. Forty-eight percent. Yeah, 48%. Yeah. Um, well, that's 2001, 20-year uh, period, 20-year period. Um, it, they've done it since inception. Surge 70. Yeah, they're they're extremely good. So let's let's segue. This, I think this is a good segue into um, one, one of the things that I learned about being in manufacturing for 12 years is when my grandfather started doing our, our trade, uh, he was using wood chisels and a hammer to make uh, patterns for like what our job is. Then CNC machines came out in the 1970s and machines started cutting tools. But if you look at the time, if you look at the tools that were available 100 years ago, it, it would have took my grandfather 
six months to a year that now takes me two days using 3d printers and 3d design. Um, and you see the same evolution of financial technology with investing. And this is why I've gravitated and I'm going full bore into composer is because for the first time in 22 years, the average individual has access to algorithmic trading at a, at an unprecedented level. And my, so historically 20% APY is insane for like Warren Buffett and people like that, but that was a hundred years ago or even 40 or 20 years ago. And now I want to argue that it could potentially, we could potentially have higher APYs uh, because we're in the early days of using these machines to capitalize on market inefficiency. And I think there will be a time maybe 20 years from now, 30, 40 years from now, where these machines basically arbitrage away all of the inefficiency and then we don't have those APYs anymore. So the theoretically, we might actually end up in a um, efficient market theory world 50 years from now. Who knows? It depends on if you believe in that philosophy. I personally don't, but I think that, I think that the markets will eventually evolve into efficiency. So what's your what's your take on that? Points there, yeah. The, the first is, and you mentioned composer. Composer is the future, in, in my opinion, um, in, in investing. I mean, there's nothing else like it. Um, I, I just think, like, like you mentioned about your grandfather taking, you know, a week to build something that you can build in, uh, you know, a few hours. Uh, you know, there there was motif and M one, and then composer's taking that to another level. Um, so, yeah, and I think, um, you know, Jim Simmons at Rentec has talked about that. They, they build machines there and, and strategies, essentially. And sometimes those strategies no longer work because other people find out about them, but they're constantly building new strategies. And, and I think Composer gives uh, people the, the a wherewithal to continue to innovate and continue to build. And, um, you know, to me, yeah, it's, you know, it, no one can predict the future, but to me, I use I use interactive. I use I use Vanguard. You know, Kyle Birmingham, you know, worked there before. Um, you know, Vanguard, uh, TD Ameritrade, Motif, interactive brokers, and and Composer's the future, man. So you so you worked at Vanguard. Uh, I, I mean, I know Vanguard is far. No, I, I didn't work there. I said Kyle. Uh, you know, Kyle. Yeah. Composer. Yep. He worked at Vanguard, but I have a, I have a Vanguard account. I got a Vanguard account, I have a TD Ameritrade account, um, I had a Motif account, I had a Folio account, um, I, I had an M1 account. So I've used a lot of the different brokers, you know, um, and I just feel that what Composer is doing is, is really the future, man. Yeah, I absolutely agree. It, the uh, I would like to sit down with Kyle or somebody that's got insider experience with hedge funds and, and Wall Street and get their opinion on on what we're doing here in this discord as in compared to uh, comp competing with Wall Street. I don't know if you've been keeping up with the chats in the discord, but there's a big argument that we can't compete with Wall Street or that um, we shouldn't be sharing and marketing or we shouldn't be, uh, we should close down the community a little bit so that Wall Street doesn't pick up on what we're doing and then basically arbitrage out and do it and copy and paste. And my argument, is that eventually this discord will be 10,000 users or 50,000 users or a hundred thousand users. I know wall street bets is over hundred K users. Um, and I think they've capped out and I think that this could easily get to that level. Um, and eventually we'll be in a situation one, we're going to have to be way more organized. We're going to have to have better systems, but I, I come from manufacturing and I come from studying history and especially war. I was, I've always been a big uh, fan of military science and military history. And have you, have you studied war a lot? Yeah. I mean, I've read, you know, Sun Tzu and Machiavelli and Clausewitz and, and that crowd. Um, yeah. So it's not like, I, I didn't go like to West Point and study, like if I were a general, <laughs> like, what, how to actually move troops. No. So actually, so, so I, I am into that, but that's not where I was going with it. Um, I was going towards the economic side of war and a lot of people, uh, a lot of people 
equate winning wars to like the generals or the skills or the people or like the morale or, or whatever, or specific battles or specific like heroic stories, um, like battle of the bulge or Leonidas and 300. Um, but the reality is all wars, if you look at the numbers are won by manpower and output, they're, they're won by economic output. So it's like, if you have two things that are competing in this case, hedge funds versus this discord, it doesn't matter how smart the, the people are at the hedge fund or how much billions of dollars they have. I mean, they can throw their weight around and shut something down or like, or corner the market. There's th ways to do that. But eventually it gets to a point where if you have 10 people producing strategies and symphonies and, and evol evolving, and the, you only have one person on the competition, it gets into a situation where it's pure economic output. So there, if there's more manpower over here, it doesn't matter how intelligent or sophisticated the other competition cut out cut out again you're back you're back okay you're back uh let me see if i can get back to that, that stream but what i was saying is it doesn't matter how intelligent or how much money it, uh, they have another way to explain this um is you can build a car that has 5,000 horsepower but it doesn't mean that it has enough tire to put it on the track so if you have if you're if you've got five race cars uh, competing against 500 race cars, they might not be the most efficient or the most sophisticated or the most uh, technologically advanced, but just pure numbers, you're going to output more. So what's your opinion on like that theory? Yeah. So back to the, like kind of the hedge funds, wall street versus the discord or, or, you know, or people are wondering that it's going to get arbitraged away or stolen, if you will. I have to remember that, um, a lot of big money hedge funds and endowment funds, they aren't able to deal with volatility. Yes. Because they will get fired. And so <laughs> if you look at a lot of a lot of these strategies, um, you know, at least some of the initial ones, maybe the ones now are like so sophisticated the drawdowns aren't as bad. But even drawdowns like are like eighteen percent, twenty six percent, forty percent. Some of the hedge funds, um, they would the, the capital would flee from their fund. Um, or if they're an endowment fund, they would be recommended to be, to be fired. Um, you know, I, I have a couple different quotations of mine that I post in the description of my YouTube channel, sort of uh, quotations regarding finance. And um, the one quotation that applies here for me personally, um, the ability to deal with volatility is a superhuman power in investment. Yes. Um, Warren Buffett said, I, I would sooner have a choppy 15% return and a smooth 11% return, which goes against kind of modern portfolio theory of, you know, of reducing drawdowns. But at the end of the day, and even like, like my composer portfolio, if someone were to look at it and you're like, oh man, you know, you were at 180,000 or 270 and now you're at 200,000, like you're down 70 or $80,000. Like, I would say whoop de do. <laughs> like at the end of the day, if these strategies, I'll give you an example, I have two balanced alpha and all weather that have returned one at 16%, one at 14% from, since 2012. Now they've been down recently because we're in inflation, but at the end of, of uh, the day, meaning in 2030, 2035, 2040, if I'm obtaining alpha, um, and so, so, you know, I was, I was down a little bit in certain periods, the volatility more extreme than, than people than the average person can deal with. So, um, so I, so that's the one thing. And I, and I think that, you know, there is something to be said, and even in the medallion fund, they limit the amount of capital, but it's billions of dollars. So there would have to be like hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars, Garen, running some of these strategies in order for them possibly to not work. And then you're constantly innovating, creating new ones. So, um, you know, and, and, and people that are cynical or negative on it, you're looking at the back test. I guess I would say, look, you know, talk to me in 2030. <laughs> yeah. Maybe they're right. Here. You know, maybe, maybe they're right. Like maybe the cynics, you know, are going to use terms like overfitting and hindsight bias and, you know, so, but, and, and again, I have, I have enough wealth. One last thing, I have enough wealth where if it doesn't work out, these are the real estate and the TV Ameritrade. That if the composer strategies, the more uh, avant-garde ones, however, whatever anyone described these, um, don't work. It's not the end of the world. 
but it's certainly they're based on logic they're based on rules and uh i i think that over time they're gonna do quite well yeah i uh had two things uh you just said um f first was the 20 percent drawdown and volatility and hedge funds can't handle that i'll get to that but yeah. the other one was what you just said um what, repeat what you just like the last two lines last three lines Oh, maybe they're wrong. Maybe, maybe they're wrong. Maybe they're right. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah. Just, you know, like you're going to have cynics when you, when you post on message boards and, and such, you're going to, people are going to see these returns. And I think Derek had mentioned it like, well, you know, that's better than medallion. So there's no way that you can outperform him. You know, we'll, we'll see, but a, a lot of these things are based on rules, um, based on RSI, based on MACD, based on momentum. Um, and you know, and, and again, sometimes you shoot, you know, what's the expression? You shoot for the moon, you hit the stars or vice versa. Meaning if, if one of these AP, AP wise is, you know, 200% it returns 29%. Yeah. Not 200, but 29. Yeah. But you're in the realm of, of Carl Icahn, <laughs> top 0 0.01 of the 1% in investing. So even if you're not like hitting these astronomical, um, you know, returns, um, and you're still attaining major alpha you're in a great position can you see my screen or can you see my sh screen share yeah, uh, um so um, have you, see you. Uh, so click on the watch stream there should be a another uh, video there okay. let me know when you're watching okay yep yeah. i don't know if you've uh if, if you saw the start here channel but uh somebody one of the users i think it was uh um, Brian's he uh, posted this uh, portfolio with com without computer or composer discord and then uh, as soon as he joined into the composer discord so it's we'll find out you know it's it's an experimentation really like this entire discord yeah. composer everything we're doing is experimentation yeah. but yeah and, and what's interesting too remember I have just a two composer accounts one is my own which is down and those were strategies I created like from motif and kind of pre-discord and um you know again i used the ray dalio all weather leverage version um balanced alpha and that those still again going back 10 years still have returned 16 and 14 percent but recently they they've been down but then i opened uh, an account for my mother and her account is using a lot of your strategies that um have a lot of that negative correlation that are bouncing up the market is going down um, and is done quite well. So that's the, it's even what it kind of shows is the evolution of composer. You know that composer maybe started as you know more like hedge just hedge fundy basic strategies, and now it's a lot more sophisticated uh, and, and superior strategies that have been created. Yeah, um, you care to uh, share your screen and uh, walk us through your um, portfolios and stuff, and, and while you get that set up. I'm going to do a shameless plug for the server. Um, if anybody hasn't seen it yet, there is now a donation channel. So if you enjoyed this live stream or just enjoyed the Discord as well, and you want to help support and grow this Discord and everything that we're doing, um, that'll be there. But yeah, um, there was also one thing to go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, back to the hedge funds and their inability to handle volatility. That's one. That's one major thing. Um, when it, when it comes to business design, you, you have pe people look at wall street and they look at hedge funds and they look at everything going on there and they see it as this immutable indestructible force that's been around for a hundred years or more, depending on how much you study. Um, and that it'll just always be here and it'll, it'll never go away. And that's just the way the world is. And that's, I think it's kind of like this immutable dominating force in finance but if you study history and you study it long enough you everything has a life cycle everything has a rise and it has a fall and i think composer is the in my opinion philo philosophically or uh, um, historically composer is the gateway or the opening of the door to pandora's box which will inevitably create the downfall of hedge funds where you get into system design where a hedge funds incentives and structure in its internal structure and its mot motives for development and growth is different than what we are. So like you said, they can't handle volatility. They can't, um, th their goal is not to make 
30% APYs for their investors. Their, their goal is to build as much asset under management, AUM, as they can so that they can charge their users fees so that they can revenue, so that they can profit and they can make their bank and they can play it safe and secure. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. That's that, you know, it's a very successful business model because they're the richest companies in the world. Um, but we're entering into this new era where it's decentralized community designed strategies that don't care about volatility. Well, we care, but we don't care. Our, our incentive structures are much, much different than those. And when it gets into a ver a comp competing versus B competing, whichever system has a better incentive structure, um, and has more economic output is typically going to win. In my opinion, that's my philosophy. We'll see. Yeah, yeah, and it's and, and both will be there moving forward. I don't think one's going to win and yeah. the other necessarily maybe. But and I think, you know, I would say maybe their goal is a 30% return, but they can't try to shoot for a 30% re return and have a 50% drawdown because the loose capital uh, from their investor will, will shut down. Or if they're an endowment fund, they'll get fired from their portfolio manager position. So they're not able to uh, endure as much volatil as volatility as an individual who doesn't answer to anyone. I feel that not having to answer to anyone is also a superhuman power. Yes. So if you're having to answer to like, you're an endowment, so you, there's a board, a hedge fund, you have to answer to your clients who are saying, are we up today? Are we down today? You know, and, and Charlie Munger, you know, talked about this, um, you know, just having a long-term perspective um, sets you ahead of, of most everyone in markets. So, so for example, you know, you'll see like, even in this Discord, you'll see like portfolio share, and, you know, that, that's fine. Thinking day to day, week to week, am I up this week? Am I down this week? Am I up this month? You know, whereas I, I think, um, across decades. Yeah. And that served me well, you know, even like over Christmas of 2018, I think it was, uh, markets were down and, you know, I was ripped other costs and collecting dividends, reinvesting, you know, things balanced, you know, we've had this big sell off and, you know, because of my other holdings, um, because I don't get rattled, I'm able to endure the volatility and, and just keep moving forward. So, um, yeah, hedge funds don't, don't have that luxury, man. They just don't. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's they've been converted to a family office <laughs> they, again, they don't, they don't answer to anyone. Yeah. 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 If you're a more closed system, you don't have it, but then you have an issue of like output and, um, all that. The, uh, <clears throat> that's one thing I do want to, I want to, I've been seeing, uh, since we've had a red day today in the market, people are posting, uh, and kind of worrying about it and stuff. And I've seen some people ma trying to manually trade their strategies and it's like, you're, I can't tell anybody what to do with their money. Um, but the goal and the point of composer is to not worry about it and let the, if you trust the strategies and you understand what you're investing in and how they work, um, which is up to me and the builders to educate people that you, you, you shouldn't be thinking in daily terms. You should be thinking in, in quarterly in yearly in five years, 10 years. Um, there, I think we actually had our first, uh, one, somebody posted their first 100% APY, returns on composer in the portfolio showcase. I should have pinned it or did I pin it? Uh, let me see if I pinned it. I hope I pinned it. Ah, uh, so if somebody can find that one and ping me and link that, that post, but somebody did has a hundred percent returns portfolio in okay. Oh, Kyle's 85. Um, there it is. Narwhal 105% returns in uh, all by August. So August, September, October, three months, two months. There's no way it probably had to be longer than that, but, um, yeah, I'm gonna... yeah I mean, it, I think that's, yeah, I've seen some of those on in the portfolio showcase. It's amazing, but yeah, I mean, just, just having that longer term view and, and, and you know, and you mentioned that, you know, there's a, in the book that I referenced that uh, Derek shared, on, on Jim Simmons, there was a period renaissance when, you know, they, they were down and some people were thinking they should like pull the money from the algorithms. And Jim Simmons was like, no, trust the algorithms. Like we've done a lot of work on this. It goes back. Um, trust the algos. There were people that were like kind of, kind of wanting to, to pull the plug a little bit, stop the bleeding. Um, you know, so, uh, 
and that's why I said these these things that are being built now, it doesn't interest me to hold them for a month and sixty eight percent. It interests me if I can hold them from twenty twenty two to twenty thirty two, twenty thirty eight. Put really as fast as that. That's my goal set too. It could be. We're we're creating that gets into the interesting conversation of overfitting. Technically, so when we when I started this Discord and we started doing all this. I was thinking about overfitting and I'm like, we are 100% overfitting. Like all of these strategies are just hyper overfitted for a specific situation. And then it, it evolved into, okay, so what's the signal? What's, what's the underlying economic conditions that are happening here that are creating these insane APYs? The beta ballers is the prime example. Um, and then we, we sat down as a community and we probably collectively we have done maybe 12 hours of live streams and calls trying to figure out what the hell is creating this beta baller signal um are you familiar with signal strength and all that for well i guess i'll explain it for anybody that doesn't know what signal strength is you can look at it as a zero to 100 uh 50 being like the break even mark and anything above 50 or above a 0.5 the signal strength is profitable or or strong uh, and anything below that, you're getting negative or bearish returns. So the goal of a signal strength is to isolate what what is the economic condition that's creating this machine to perform and profit well, and then how do we reverse engineer that so that we can turn that signal off and on when those economic conditions present themselves. And that's what the framework designs have been done, the volatility framework and Derek's uh, um, int rising interest rates and closing interest rates strategy. That framework is an attempt to isolate what what's going on with beta ballers and how can we turn it off and on so that we become more efficient overall with our strategies. And then you can start nesting strategies that work really well. They're, they're overfitted for a specific period of economic conditions, but we can turn them off and on. Therefore, the overfitting doesn't matter. We, we actually want to overfit and then plug them into the frameworks so that they turn on at those specific times. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, to the point where, you know, looking out to 2035 uh, and so on and so forth, it's why, I don't know if you notice in some of the comments, some of the strategies, like, you put in, I think, in T, triple Q for the long term, you had something called better QQQ, which were individual stocks. And I said, I had someone, I think Raycon rebuilt it, or I did, or I, but I took it out and he, he reworked it. But I took out the better QQQ because I didn't want things that really had any single stocks mm -hmm. uh, in them because it was like showing, well, maybe this was the past five years, but in capitalism and financial markets, these single stocks are likely to, maybe it would work for another two or three years, but in 10 years, maybe it wouldn't be as relevant. Whereas the indices, um, these signals might very well be relevant 10 years from now, 15 years from now, essentially in perpetuity. But even just having that long-term thinking, not wanting to really incorporate um, a lot of singles, individual stocks. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I've, I've moved towards that mindset. I, I think... Um we you have a back test bias and a survivorship bias when you do the individual stocks and the only way that's the, the nice thing about the ETFs, and i think we should only design with etfs uh, for the foreseeable future with the exception that when composer releases a dynamic fundamental screener or a dynamic screener of some sort that's when we can essentially create our own etfs uh, it, but then we're still, we still have the issue of the 400 ticker limit on portfolios, which is another hurdle to cross. Um, but that's another gateway too. I, I'm excited to see Composer release a fundamental dynamic screener because then the APY, we can start screening for fundamentals of like really low debt to equity companies during economic recessions and high cash flow or high growths and dividends and stuff like that. And th these strategies that are producing these insane APYs now, we might see even more crazy uh, APYs from that. Um, Overall, I'm excited, but yeah, let's jump into your pool. And I, I, I'm actually running the magic formula of Joel Green. I'm just running it manually. So I'm going to the magic formula website, um, producing the results, putting the composer. And then in December, 
I'll do that again and I'll put the new the new stocks in there. Yeah, that's a good way to do it. If you're doing like a yearly rebalancing or something like that, that can work. Um, I don't, I'm not organized enough for that. I uh, I just like to build the machines and turn them on and let them run for the next 10 years. Um, but if you want to share share your screen and we'll, we'll hop into your portfolio and then we'll we'll how finish. Do I, how do I do it? I have my um, screen open here. <laughs> I think you're, I think you're live. Um, let me, do, yeah, I can see your screen now. So you can just pull up uh that and then uh, yeah we'll do about 10 minutes of uh going through your portfolio and then we'll open it up to q a for any anybody that wants to uh, ask him questions or talk about anything specifically so do you, do you see my portfolio right now yeah i can see you got 25 percent apy uh or cumulative returns okay great great okay great so... and this is your original one this this is this your mom's or is this your original no no this is my own so this is mine and this has a lot of strategies that I built, um, you know, motif and, and brought them over. And then it has some, uh, a small amount of things from the discord. And, um, you know, what Kyle, when he did a profile, uh, on me, he said that I kind of have a data set of a hedge fund because I'm running so many strategies. I think maybe we could count it, but it's probably 80 strategies here again. I mean, there's, I like, I, I'll get uh, interested in something and I'll, and I'll follow it and I'll throw a little bit of money uh, at it. Um, so just scrolling here, you know, like actually I think this was yours here, the SPY Strength Catcher version two. Yep. Um, that one's been kind of, uh, that's, yeah, one of the original versions. It hasn't been performing insanely good, but uh, that was before I really understood uh, bear market strategies and, and learned from Derek on his stuff. Yeah, and um, this is one, you know, I think permanent store of wealth, the 40 TFs. This one's held up, you know, we've been in a, in a big decline. But that's one that, um, you know, hasn't gotten as crushed as the ones using leverage ETFs where there's extreme volatility. And that's also, you know, you, you see that Composer released for Opus 12. Um, the permanent store of wealth, 40 ETFs, it's a 70, 10, 10, 10 uh, portfolio. Okay. But, um, VOO, BND, uh, VNQ, and DBC. So, 10% commodities, 10% bonds, 10% real estate, 70% stocks. So I noticed in your, your graph up above, if you scroll back up, um, this is something, a request I want from Composer devs. It, it, so you got the big spike up where you deposited and it look, looks like you deposited more and your it looks like the charts are yeah. down, but it says cumulatively your returns are 25%. So is... Um, I, what I would love to see from the devs is the ability to turn off, uh, deposit or remove deposits from the graph. So that way we can see purely cumulative returns of a portfolio. Uh, but have you found that even with the bear market, this old, this old portfolio, that's very hedge fund designed and very like, it's not running the crazy strategies that we're building in the discord. Are you still profitable and still overall, uh, beating the market? compared to the um, I, I may be beating the market but I'm still down right now with um, with the big sell-off yeah and, and that's because I use a lot of strategies that use leverage and so you know it kind of cuts both ways and so some of the strategies like so for example I ran let me show you two here and this is actually a great point to make so the two main strategies I've run these since I was with uh, motif and then it was with folio and then interactive brokers okay you see this here balanced out for three times leverage you can see i i basically rolled this into composer and um you know it has tmf so it's really sold off um you can see today it's, it's up you know 2000 but this is a strategy that back tests going 10 years to right now about 16 percent karen okay so for me so most people would see this and be like oh my god you know it was 88 and then it's 56 and they would like freak out, like, oh, that that's like su such a big drawdown. And again, I feel like this is why, at, you know, at, at 42, I kind of I am where I am, so to speak, uh, in, in my financial position, because I'm able to see and think long term. I'll take a drawdown like this to have a 16% return the long term. Now, again, there's no guarantee moving forward that initially happened. But I'm just saying that that's something where here you see this is down. Um, the all weather strategy also have. Um, a significant amount. Um, you can see that 74 down to 51. Um, that's Ray Dalio's all-weather strategy, but run with leverage. 
Um, you know, that, that's returned 14% um, since 2000, November, October, November 2012. I see you got the... I'll take this volatility. I, I see you got the uh, the TTTQ for the long term up there. What version is that? Are you running? Um, that one, uh, version three. That was a great look at the one seventy five. That one's up to two eighteen. Um, so you can see some of these discord strategies uh, are some, you know, that have done well. The other thing is I I put the lion share um, when I transferred in guarantee just before the big sell-off, I transferred in like November, December. Um, so then the big sell-off happened. Um, here's one you can hear, Dippy QD version one. Yeah, that, that one, that was my first one I think I launched with. And it uh, it also, I, I didn't understand bear market strategy yet when I built that one. So that's it, understandable, it's down. I saw you had uh, version two of the TTTQ as well, or version three, you had two, you had two or three of them. Um, I think the yeah, yeah and this one is also a Discord one. SPY versus RJA. Um, that's also a Discord one. So you know I've been running as these, and you can see they're smaller amounts because I allocated a you know a bigger amount before. But I've been kind of you know running. Here's the uh, version two. Uh, that's down a little bit here. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean I'm definitely intrigued by a lot of these Discord strategies, and and this one you can see. Franken Symphony has done uh, well. And then I believe it was Michael Blatnick who kind of took a lot of them and fused them into one. The Franken Symphony. Symphony. Um, version three here is up slightly. Yeah, the so, if you want, I think one of the best ones we've seen with uh, with uh, TTTQ for the long term is four point two. I think it had a lot of heavily mods from Hanoma or Hanomi and uh a few others that had uh, put in a lot of work on that one um that's one of the strongest ones if you want to grab that in the discord server yeah yeah maybe someone can send that to me i'll, I'll definitely uh, follow that and the one that composer had um in in their rollout was the nasdaq mean reversion this is one of the few yeah and I, I put a lot of that capital in november december but you can see the 2000 in 2600 so the nasdaq mean reversion uh, initial one has done quite well. I haven't seen that one. I'll have to I'll have to check that one. Or could, uh, could you open that up and link it in the chat real quick? Yeah, let me see here. So if I click on it, Nasdaq mean reversion. Oh, is this the? I think this is the one. That... This is pro this is probably. Uh, I know what this. This is probably the original. Um, yes. Nasdaq by the dip. Yeah, yeah, that's Nasdaq by the dip. Yeah. Yeah. So that that was. You can see it. Go ahead. I was just going to say, um, you can see that, I think that, if I'm not mistaken, Garen, is that's the one that you used to start, if I'm not mistaken, the TQQ. Correct. Yep. Term, maybe? No. Um, you used this as a base or started it. Yeah. So uh, the T, the triple Q uh, for the long term was Derek's design. I, I took that and I designed another one and then. Um, there's actually two strategies that I haven't released or I haven't made YouTube videos on, but they performed really well today, um, is the, let me share my screen or go back to my portfolio. Um, I've got the K, uh, K wave and one day mean reversion and the one day mean reversion was built off of a, uh, Reddit post actually, where somebody, somebody graphed out the daily one day cumulative returns of QQQ and SPY over uh, since 1999. And I basically took that and I, I built a mean reversion strategy called the V1 QQQ DMR. And then also the semiconductor K wave, uh, which both are good. They're profitable today. The, the semiconductor K wave is actually up 4%. Um, but yeah, that's, that's where I kind of want to get back to uh, with this as as more strategies roll out i think think the franken symphony style design or even having an, a, the advanced framework design with multiple strategies nested together uh, be able to rebalance themselves and overall you get actually a better drawdown and a better cumulative returns on the, in the long run um at least that's what i'm seeing and i think the manhattan project is a good example of that on the back test where yeah uh, i think the TTTQ for the long term, it has a pretty good drawdown. 
Um, the beta ballers is very, it's got like a 50% drawdown, but when you combine the two, it reduce, they, they balance each other out and the drawdown is only like, uh, 20% or so. And the cumulative returns are like 2,700 over a six month or one year back test. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, as I mentioned to you before, probably January 10th, January 15th, I'm going to be allocating about 25,000, 30,000 or so. Um, and what I'd like to do is choose 30, 35, 40 of these strategies, um, the newer ones, you know, the Manhattan Project, the Beta Bowlers, ET, Triple Q for the long, maybe a couple different versions, and allocate 500 or $1,000 um, to a lot of these, um, these sort of avant-garde uh, symphonies that are being created right now. And again, then holding those, not just doing it for a couple months, but then holding those, Garen, for 10 years, 12 years, 15 years. That to me would be fascinating, you know, as sort of a, a test, if you will, over the long term. Yeah, the once the once the zero beta strategies uh, release November fifth, when the event's over, um, I and we test the frameworks a little bit more. I want to basically build the first uh, official community Discord community uh, release, kind of like Opus, but the Discord version. Um, and we'll we'll use the volatility framework as well as the rising and falling rates uh, framework that Derek developed, and we'll try to take the best strategies we have and nest them into something that we feel is uh, stable. Or you know, we'll we'll probably make an an extreme version that's like just insane APYs and drawdowns, and then we'll we'll make a more tame, uh, simplified yeah. version for people that are less risk adverse. What you're saying is kind of like the Franken Symphony, but but greater using that framework of nesting within nesting and nesting. Yes, yeah. So we so the frameworks. The goal is to isolate the signals. So this the str certain strategies work better during the falling rates. For example, the beta ballers. I don't know if you've kept up with the chat because it's like 1,500 messages at this point. But uh, we we found that the beta ballers works extremely well when bonds and stocks are both collapsing and also potentially uh, bond yield curve inversion amplifies the returns. But essentially we want, we want to be able to turn that strategy off and on using the frameworks. And then when those market conditions change, we switch to a different strategy and we just continue to evolve and develop from there. Yeah, it's fascinating. Fascinating. And definitely when um, I'm allocating that capital Maybe it's something we can track, you know, for the Discord of, you know, it's not, it's not as much as the, the, the 200,000, but it'll be an extra maybe 20, 25,000 and, and seeing how that, how that does. And maybe coordinating with you and Derek on the exact 30 or 35. The other thing I, I would mention is like, and you had mentioned it also, is there's just so many different permutations now that it's hard to keep up on which, which you should choose essentially because... It's great because they're going like crowdsource essentially, essentially, or open source. But um, just it's almost overwhelming, right? <clears throat> Many different yeah. permutation. Yeah, we're, we're working on organization. Um, we'll we'll probably uh, we're testing out this new forum strategy where we have just the, the evolutions and the the post and the the new uh, shares forum yeah. and then we'd have the disc uh, discussion separated but it's probably going to get to the point where we'll have to offline the databases into um, some kind of like notion or something and we'll have to build some kind of organization system that'll be a lot easier when the discord starts revenueing and i can allocate capital to designing those systems and then that'll be an integral part to the the server but for now it's it's just the forums um so you want to hop into your other uh your other portfolio, the one that you've been running with the new uh, machines? Um, I'd have to log out and log in because it's a separate email on that. Okay, go ahead and kill your stream. And then, uh, yeah, if anybody, if any of you guys have questions for anything, go ahead and post them in the chat and then I'll give you guys voice access and you can you can ask questions individually. And actually, it's great that we're doing these, these two here because you're able, these are, I would almost call my Discord portfolio um there we go okay so uh, let me hop back in there okay yep yeah we're here okay great so look at the cumulative and again that's skewed because of the um uh of the addition of capital um but what's fascinating about this is well one i put the lion's share of the money at 
you know, November, December, the other account. This one I, I put in uh, much more recently, but you can see this one doesn't have these mass big drawdowns that uh, the other one did, right? You're able to see that. What was your initial capital investment, 20 grand? A little less, so it's up a little. Um, I'd have to pull up and see, but it's definitely up. The other one was down, this is definitely up. Um, and you can see the names. So look at the names here. You'll you'll recognize a lot of these, Garrett. SPY RSI Driven Allocation Version 1. Um, SPY Energy Chips and Commodities. Uh, this is a guy, remember the beginning, J1 was doing some. JJ's Canary Leverage Light. I don't know if I, I haven't seen JJ. I'm not familiar with those. I'm assuming those are Slack. Uh... in the Slack. Okay. He was in the Slack. Right? He hasn't been in the Discord, but he was... Uh, Actually, for a little bit in the, in the Slack channel, created these and then shoot him a uh, if you've talked to him, shoot him a, a DM on Slack and try to get him into the Discord. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, then you see the, the for the long term version two, and then look at the returns here. Okay, so you see, you know, version two, well, well JJ 1100, 1183, this one's up $604. <laughs> yeah, you can see that that. That's done really well in real capital, not not just, you know, like I, we talked about kind of cynics and, you know, it's overfit, it's this, it's that. This is, you know, real capital. Can you scroll over a little bit? When did you invest in that? That's uh, September what? September, it doesn't, it's not able, there isn't like a... Oh, it's not letting you scroll over? That's weird. Yeah, but it's definitely in the first 10 days because September is zero, so it's within the first 10 days of September. Wow, so you're 60% on TTTQ in a very short period of time. <laughs> What's the 200-day MA 3X leverage V1? Is that a Discord or is that a Slack channel one? I'm yeah, not. All, all these are pretty. Yeah, all these are pretty much Discord. Um, I can't remember who created this. It was Death or the Slack. This was in the Slack. Yeah, I'm not familiar with this one. Yeah, I can share this with you um, after you know the thing here. This one, go to the annualized. Sharp 3.3, this is going, last three years. Um, oh, this is, um, it mentions original commodity trend in Black Swan Catcher by Garen Phillips, oil gas trend inspiration from Cody Haas, overfits and other trends by Eric Snellman. So in the Slack, it was a lot of Cody, Eric, and yourself. And then in the Discord, I haven't seen them as, as active. Um, it's more Derek uh, and... Raycon and uh, a couple other people, but Cody and um, Eric were very active. Yep, Derek. Derek originally he didn't even know that the Slack existed. I uh, I poached him from the Reddit because uh, I saw his his post, and then I messaged him, and then got him. Uh, I did the YouTube video, and then got him into an in interview, and now he's here. Yeah, yeah. So this one is uh, you can see the return. Let's go back. And I love geeking out on composure, by the way. Like, I love doing this. I'm like, oh, what if you change the date? Or what if you change this? I mean, you know, 472%. It's obscene. <laughs> when you look at this, 300, I mean, it's like, yeah, so. So, this one. We can, we can do the math on the TTTQ. If you're up 60% in a month, that's that's just insane. <laughs> I don't even know what that it a, is. A, <laughs> and, and, it's, and it's to the point of, like, People saying, oh, well, it's back test. It's not. Let's see. I mean, look, I don't have a crystal ball, but let's see. I have real capital here. Uh, I'm going to put more real capital here. It's not going to be just back tested. And let's do a, a video in 2025, you know, and see where it is. And the, again, I want to reemphasize for all the new people in, don't worry about the daily movements that don't, you should not be focusing on the daily movements. That It's not what Composer is designed for. These are swing trades, swing uh algos that are technically supposed to be designed for years and decades at least that's how i design um everybody's got their own design philosophy yeah yeah um this one here 266 so that one's up um you know 200 day moving three times leverage 224 there's a new yin yang Der derek's got a new yin yang i think by the way if you uh okay. if you're looking for exposure into china yeah this was a yin yang challenge yeah, maybe they swap it out. Um, there's the logic on the FXI. Yeah, I, I took a stab at the yin yang. It was it was difficult. It's a uh, it's a hard. It, there's so much volatility and so much movement in the Chinese market. Yeah, without a doubt. 
out. So, so you, you can see, like, this is kind of like a Discord portfolio, right? I mean, I have a couple that aren't from the Discord or the Slack, but for the most part, I would say, you know, 90% of these are from the Slack or Discord. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's hop into Q&A because uh, we're about to 100, a minute, an hour and 25 yeah. in. Um, so yeah. Derek wants to know, who you, who's your favorite celebrity investor? I would probably be Warren Buffett. Um, just because I, I've done a deep study of Buffett, uh, and even though we're talking about algorithmic trading here, I, I still really gravitate to fundamental, the low PE, buying things that are you know, worth a dollar that are trading for 50 cents. And um, yeah, so I, I would say Warren um, first. And then I would say maybe Grant Cardone second because he taught me the real estate, either Grant or Robert Kiyosaki <laughs> is second because I have, you know, one hand in the stock market and then one hand in real estate. So there's a couple of moves there. Nobody else have any other questions? I, there's a lot of people in here. I think, oh, somebody asked, I think uh, Hassan asked, I think he left. Uh, maybe he'll rewatch the recording, but he asked, uh, which do you think the market's at a bottom? Um, this is uh, the part where we say this is not financial advice and we can't tell you what's going on in the market, but um, I don't think it's the bottom. I, I'd like to hear your opinion on this. Yeah, I, I try not to get into prognostications on market calls. And actually, Monish Pabri, who I mentioned, um, he's a, the disciple of Buffett. Um, he says, avoid all macro, which is the antithesis of someone like Ray Dalio is all macro, right? Yeah. Um, um, I, I don't generally get into market calls. Um, if I, if you push me, I, I would say, I, I don't think it's the bottom. Um, I, I don't think it's going to be a massive crash. Um, but you know, I wouldn't be surprised if the Dow goes 26, 27,000, not, you know, I don't think it'll broach 25. Yeah, I, uh, I, I definitely something I'll pull back. How about you? We, uh, we had a community call Sunday night. Um, and, uh, we're going to have another one Sunday night, uh, this coming Sunday, if you want to hop on it, but, uh, a guy in there named USMC, he, uh, I'm not sure his background, but he definitely is some kind of professional in the financial sector. He, uh, was getting into explaining credit default swaps and how we were trying to find some charts on uh, corporate default swaps and noticing that there's been an increase in uh, defaults in the uh, corporate world as well as I think there's starting to be treasury default swaps too and that when we compared that to the 2000 or to uh, um, COVID and as well as the housing market crash there's a tremendous amount of room for more defaults to happen. And if they continue upward as interest rates rise and as uh, unemployment rises and people start getting squeezed through their credit and defaulting, we could see a catastrophic cascade effect occur. But w w is that going to happen? I don't know. It depends. Um, we have elections coming up and there's also going to be a political play to not have crazy high interest rates. I think the feds and the politicians are trying to curb inflation as fast as they can to drop it down so that they can reverse it and drop the rates so that they can get votes and, and continue on with their, uh, the presidency and everything that's going on. Who knows, you know, it, with economics, everything's changing. There's a billion things happening every second and, a, and billions of people influencing the markets and all of them have opinions and emotions. And there's 400 million companies in the world, all influencing the markets every single second. So you can't predict yeah. it. You don't know. Um, but I say, I would say there's a lot of room for downside. Yeah. Yeah. I think so too. I mean, I, I just don't think it would be like a, a crash like a 2008 or, or 2020. I think where we have now is kind of a slow bleed, um, but, you know, and I think we might have a little bit more of a slow bleed uh, on the way, you know, like if we're, you know, down 29,000, down 30,000 ish, maybe be down to 26, 27, uh, you know, maybe 25, but um, I, I don't see a massive, and, and, and it, again, it depends on a lot of other factors, what's going on in Ukraine, uh, with OPEC, with interest rates, so there's a lot of, a lot of variables feeding into that. Um, Dog water tamale as the SS, I guess, about um, next bull run and explosive. I don't think it's going to be explosive as similar to 2020, 2021. I think it's going to be more of a slow rise, even kind of choppy. 
I think you're going to see these choppy markets. You know, people are saying today on CNBC, it's, maybe what we had today is a bear market rally. Um, you know, that you're going to see sort of this, this choppiness, this sideways movement. And so I wouldn't be surprised even on the next bull market. Yeah, I, I, I take a, a very technical analysis approach to, uh, to this because I've been looking at charts for five years now. Um, it depends on the drawdown and it depends on the violence. So in technical analysis, the theory is uh, there's always equal and opposite reaction. So if we crash hard, the snapback bullish will be even harder. Uh, and if we crash slow, then the bull run will be slower. Um, not necessarily. It also depends a lot on public sentiment and the news and uh, big money manipulating the markets with the news. Um, so if they start pumping out, you know, recessions over, inflation's coming down, rates are coming down, you know, invest your firstborn child into the market because you're going to make a shit ton of money. Um, you'll see a massive rip. Uh, so it, it, there's a lot of factors there. But on a purely technical perspective, it's equal and opposite reactions. Uh, and the farther down it crashes, typically the harder it bounces back. But it just depends. I do agree that we'll probably see choppiness. I don't. I it. I think. I think inflation or, or this wave of money into the into the money supply is not done. I, th I think we're curbing it temporarily. Uh, but there, there's no guarantee that all of the money that was printed through COVID has entered into circulation and balanced and equalized out into the system. It could be a situation where we're just seeing temporary manipulation from interest rates rising from the Federal Reserve, as well as the media pumping fear into the market to push, to try to control the situation. Uh, and then if yeah. it could, it, I could be totally wrong and we might reverse and just rip to the next, we might have another leg of a bull run uh, and then we hit the top and then it comes down, but, or it could just go sideways for 10 years. It, it really, the nice thing about the algos is I don't really care <laughs> if the market goes down, I'm going to make money. If the market goes sideways, I'm going to make money. If the market goes up, I'm going to make money. Well, that's what's fascinating looking at these um, discord algos basically and slack algos. Because if you even just do like a year to date or one year and the market's been down, uh, a lot of these have done quite well. And so that's that's also encouraging and fascinating uh, to me is that, you know, it's like what a great uh, time to test these things on, on a situation like what we have now. Yeah, did you see uh, the two posts that I put today, the dot-com bust and the NASDAQ two-liner? These are basic newbie strategies that I, uh, I built one and then... Uh, uh, Derek built the other one, but these are literally just like one or two lines of code and they're designed to teach people like mean reversion and parity switching and, uh, um, all that. But the, these two strategies, if you back, one can be back tested to 1999 and the other one can be back tested to 2007 before the housing market crash. Um, and so let's do 1999. April, October is fine. But the nice, this, this is kind of a perfect example is like the, these strategies don't really care what happens in the market. They're going to continue. They might not be stable, consistent APY all the, through the entire 20 years, but overall, over a long period of time, they're extremely good. And this one, this is the, the short version that I built the NASDAQ two liner. It just absolutely rips. Uh, it's it's the same code that Derek uses on his short strategies, but this one is just the 200-day move average. Uh, invest in the Nasdaq. If we're if we're bearish, we're rotating between short uh, the Nasdaq and bonds, and then we go long when we're above the 20-day move average with a 2x of the the Nasdaq to capture that volatility, snap back up, and then uh, the dot com bust. This is actually a really interesting one because he built so this code is actually well first off it, it invests in the spy 200 day if we're above the 200 and then it's actually a dual mean reversion and parity switch in one in one line so if the strength index of qqq is less than 30 we're going to go into technology uh, etf to buy that snapback because technology is a high beta to the s p 500 so we're getting a bit of leverage there without like technically having leverage uh, but then it parity switches to the com uh, consumer staples or consumer defensive when the market's crashing. And, and this one also does exceptionally well. Um, 
it's a little down here, but that's because it doesn't have a short function. You could very easily take this code and combine it with the NASDAQ 2, and then you'd have an extremely strong uh, short function and long function. And I think that's the future of Composer, what you just said there at the very end, which is take this and combine it with this, is that you're going to see this nesting, this Franken Symphony um, Manhattan project. Um, oh, you couldn't. You're blending these different strategies and symphonies into one. I think that's really the power of, uh, of Composer. We, I, I didn't show my screen, so I had, had it off, but uh, the people on YouTube saw it. But this is the dot-com bubble uh, to now and this is the code that derek built the 200 day and then the 10 day qqq we rotate between technology and consumer staples and then this code is uh same thing but we do a short function with qld and rotating on bonds and this one does exceptionally well through this bear market um and if you guys want to find that from youtube or this stream you can find those posts in the symphony share called uh, the dot-com bust in the NASDAQ 2 liner, as well as it's in the start here section where you can go to newbie guide, uh, short selling mean reversions and parity switch. And it kind of explains to you the difference between those if you want to learn. Yeah, and you said that was in, in what channel? The, the first one was the NASDAQ? Yeah, if you want to just find both of the posts, go to the start here uh, at the very top. Yeah, and you'll see uh, newbies who want to learn, check out our guide, uh, newbie guides to short mean reversions and parity switching. And then inside that, you'll have the links to the NASDAQ two liner and the dot com uh, bust. Yeah, gotcha. Okay, great, great. All right. Well, I think uh, we're good to go. This was uh, fascinating, Garen. Very informative. Uh, very much enjoyed it. So I appreciate the invite. Yeah, absolutely. I really enjoyed it too. I feel like we covered a lot and, uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. If, uh, anybody that's in here that, uh, enjoyed it too, let make sure to let them know that you guys, uh, enjoyed it because yeah, I'm, I'm excited to do more of these interviews. I'm the, uh, we're gonna have a lot of interesting people and very intelligent people coming in here. And, uh, at the end of the day, it's all about education. And the more uh, we can distribute this information and educate people, that's that's what's going to grow the community and everything that we're doing. Yeah, and, and like I said, definitely maybe I can come back at least, uh, you know, in January when I'm allocating that capital, we can kind of like show it, how it's allocated, the decisions on choosing which exact 30 Discord style uh, symphonies. And then, you know, maybe we do a six month update on that new capital or something. <laughs> Um, you know, we can see, but I, I think that would be kind of a fun little thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. I, I've actually, I'm working with a credit specialist right now who specializes in getting 0% interest credit for like 10 to uh, 12 to 18 months. I, I think I'm going to build an Excel calculator to, uh, essentially calculate how much credit I can cover. This is an advanced, very dangerous thing for people to do. I, I don't want anybody to copy what I'm doing because I, I've studied this stuff and I, I know how to do it, but essentially I'm going to build a calculator to factor next 12 months of how much credit I can deploy into an investment or multiple investments and then cover that with income and cash flow uh, to basically kind of amplify or, or uh, improve the returns. But that's something I would never recommend anybody to do. <laughs> that's just an experiment that I want to try out. Yeah, you just got to be careful. I mean, Munger's famous statement on how people go broke liquor ladies leverage <laughs> yep absolutely but yeah here we are here we are building strategies on fucking super <laughs> exactly exactly right but just always keep that in the back of your mind you know, all these leverage etfs and you know borrowing even like what i do real estate you know using debt again in, in the grant cardone mold um but you know just that's how some people can blow leverage. You've got to be careful. Uh, there, I actually made a post about the dangers of leverage in the Discord. Um, there's a thread. <clears throat> um, it's in the builder. No, it's in the knowledge guides. And it's uh, um, risk of derivative liquidation and leverage ETF collapse. And there people don't really think about it on a macro level, but all of these leveraged ETFs, they're not usually collateralized by hard assets. They're just derivatives. And there is a potential, a very small chance that if we have a, if we have a 1929 crash again, 
all of these leverage ETFs might go insolvent and basically liquidate. And then all, all of our investments will be destroyed, but uh, we'll probably have a lot worse things, but that's definitely something to be aware of is there's no, there's no sound, like sure proof investment. Everything can come down. Uh, it just depends on to the degree, but hopefully, hopefully I'm not biting my words or uh, mark my words. Hopefully that doesn't happen, but we never know. Yeah. Yeah, very true. I mean, I know that ETNs can easily get liquidated. ETFs, like you mentioned, it would have to be kind of a, a 1929 type of event for that to happen, which certainly could happen. Yep. But all right, man, it's been great talking to you. I will get this video uploaded as fast as I can to YouTube and everything else. Definitely. My, my pleasure. Take care. Talk soon. All right. See you, man.